Matt Mitchell-Grosso here, creator of Xenoplicity and the Q system that it runs on. Today's video, let's talk about NPCs um, and, and how they work in Xenoplicity, how you can use them. The first thing uh, that you need to know about Xenoplicity, because it does work so differently from what you might be used to in other games, um, is that we make a fundamental difference between two different types of NPCs. Um, on one you have what's called extras, and then the other one you're going to have what's called regulars. And all NPCs are going to fall into one of these two categories. An extra is going to be your average Joe, your typical person in the game world. And the thing that makes an extra or extra is that they only have one hit point. That's it. That's all they ever have. One hit point. They don't have two, they don't have three, they don't have anything more than that. If you hit them and you're successful at that, they go out, okay? Now, what a defeat means is, is up to debate. It, it really depends on the narrative. It depends on what's happening in the game, right? So defeating an NPC might mean they just get knocked out unconscious. Uh, you just knock them out. It might mean that you kill them outright. It might mean that they're just uh, defe defeated and they just surrender. Oh, you know, hands up! I, I give up. You know, I'm I surrender. Okay. It can mean any of those things. It all depends on what's happening, like in the fiction, right? So you, as the game master, you as the director, you're going to make sense of that and narrate what the results are based on the circumstances, right? So you know, if I just go up and I slug someone in the jaw, maybe you know, knocking them unconscious makes a lot more sense. If I've got a sword and I decide to run them through during a fight or even during a social exchange, maybe I just pull out my sword and decide to plunge it into someone's chest. Uh, if it's an extra and they take one or more damage, then that, that's it. They die. I, I run them through and they fall down dead and that just gets narrated. Um, you know, or maybe it's an intimidation thing and I just need one success and then they just surrender, right? So it can mean any of these different things depending on what's happening in the game. Uh, now, why would you want the average person in the setting, in the world, to only have one hit point? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the idea is that it doesn't take much effort to, 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 to stop their life or to make them surrender or to knock them out, okay? Um, in Xenoplicity, damage is very, very low. Um, one damage is, is what you would typically get with an average, you know, success. Uh, two damage is severe. Three damage is epic. It's, it's really hard to do that unless you're spending initiative tokens. And again, you're still like using your momentum and using your initiative in that scene to then deal that additional damage, right? And, and some weapons are better at dealing more damage, like axes, right? They have, a, they have an ability to deal additional damage if your feet are, are basically planted, if you're not making any large movements that turn, right? So some weapons are just going to deal more damage and, and be more lethal right out the gate just based on what they are. Um, and so if you want to be really lethal, you could have like a big battle axe and that's going to, you're going to be, you know, cleaving people with that thing. It's, you're, it's going to be pretty br brutal. Um, it shouldn't be hard to eliminate, okay, in whatever way, whatever that means, it shouldn't be hard to eliminate the average NPC, the average person. The, and, and, and also, um, while player characters work differently, they don't use hit points, they're, they're going to be using wounds, it's important to note that a single hit is, is enough to actually kill even a player character. Uh, although the, the the damage that would have to get dealt from that hit would it would need to be three damage, um, so that that's an, that's enough to kill a player character is three damage all at once in the same hit location. If it's not soaked and it's not blocked somehow, that's enough to kill a character outright. So in this game, you can be fresh, you cannot have any injuries whatsoever, and one sword plunging into your chest is all it takes. One strike, one bullet right? Um, you know, if it hits the right spot, you're dead, okay? And so the same needs to be true for the NPCs. And while you, you would only have to get one damage instead of three, in the fiction, it makes no difference. In the fiction, it's still just a one-hit kill. It's a, still a one-hit knockout. And so it can happen to a player character, although it's a little bit more difficult for that to happen, but it can happen to NPCs too. And you, you want that to be on both sides of that fence. And so you want the average person to be taken out really quick, very easy. And, and, and again, this goes into the cinematic nature of Xenoplicity. The way the game plays is meant to feel like you're watching a movie or watching a television show. Um, 
it's it's not that it's scripted it's that that's the kind of cinematic gameplay you want to foster at your table right so think back to movies like rambo right what is he doing He's in the jungle. There's an entire army surrounding this guy. Or, or if you're looking at the first movie, there's like just an entire like squad of police officers that are hunting for him, right? And, and dogs too. And, and whatever, whatever the case may be, he's, he's one man and he's a one man army. You know, he, he's taken on this huge group of people. And, and scene to scene, what do you see him do? He, you just see him grab someone around the neck and then boom, they're out. Um, he stabs someone with a knife and then boom, they're out. Um, you know, he, he shoots someone with a gun and then boom, they're out. Um, there, there's no, there's no like prolonged fights where it takes like several hits to take out the average person that he is encountering, that he is dealing with, right? You want the, that kind of quick, rapid takedown for the average person, right? And what is an average person? It, well, it's anybody. It's anybody in the game that, it, that isn't playing a more pivotal, more important role, right? The, the, the guard that's stationed at the town gate, that's an extra. Uh, the, the guy that's, you know, the soldier that's patrolling the hallway that you're trying to get past, that's an extra. Um, the, the average person in a tavern that, you know, might walk up and say hi to or maybe get into a brawl with, whatever, that's an extra, right? They're all extras. Uh, the average person that you're going to encounter in any situation is an extra. And you can lump them together to create an entire group of extras. And so if you deal three damage over the course of a turn to a group of extras, well, then you get to kill or, or defeat three NPCs over the course of that turn. And again, this lends itself to a really cinematic moments where you get to have that player describe, cool, you kill three of the soldiers this turn. Narrate what that looks like, right? And so they get to narrate what that looks like over a minute of game time killing three soldiers. This allows for moments in the game to play out like what our favorite scenes are from movies like Lord of the Rings, right? It's another great example, right? You've got, you've got Gimli and Legolas, and what are they doing? At every arrow that Legolas shoots is killing another orc, right? You can't do that in a lot of other tabletop role-playing games. You can do that in Xenoplicity. Over the turn of shooting a bunch of arrows, right? You're shooting arrow after arrow after arrow. If you get three successes, you get to kill three orcs. And if you're using a special ability that allows you to do some kind of like rapid fire, like a, like a full auto, all right, then you can take out an entire group of them. You might be able to take out five or ten orcs all at once, you know, over the course of one turn, just from shooting arrow after arrow after arrow. So we have rules in place in Xenoplicity that allow that to, to, to happen. And, and part of what makes that possible are these rules with the extras. And so your average NPC is going to be an extra. Now, the other type of NPC are your regulars. These are characters in the game that are going to have between three and 10 hit points. The game master, who we call the director, they might just dictate how many hit points an NPC is going to have. Maybe they say, okay, well, I want this guy to be really tough. I'm gonna give him 10 hit points. He's, he's as tough as they possibly come, right? Or maybe he's got seven, or maybe he's got five, or, or three, or maybe you roll for it. You can roll a D8 and add two to the result, and you can get a random result for how many hit points a regular has. You can do that, whatever makes sense for you, whatever you like to do, it's your call. But the idea behind a regular is, is these are meant to be tougher fights. These are meant to be, um, you know, more experienced, more veteran, they're, they're, or maybe the villains, all right, the, the, the bosses, the mini bosses. Um, now, they can still go out in a single combat turn, especially if they're fighting like a group of player characters or like they're fighting a bunch of people all at once. Then maybe, you know, all the player characters are piling up on them and they're doing some kind of crazy group attacks and whatnot. Again, that's going to play out very cinematic as all the characters are surrounding this guy and there's this epic fight going down and they're all, you know, getting licks on this this guy that would take like concentrated effort from like the group and so again fights don't have to take a long time to be very epic and cool and you would get to narrate out all all of what that would look like all right so besides whether an NPC is an extra or a regular, what other factors come into play with an NPC? Well, number one, you need a description. You need to know what this person or creature looks like. 
Um, and, you know, and if it's a person, then they need a name. So you need to have a name, you need to have a description for what this person is. If you are porting a monster over from another system or there's a creature online that you're drawing inspiration from, uh, like a picture or an image or a description, a word description on what this thing is, right? Or maybe there's a creature you saw in a movie or a TV show that you want to use in Xenoplicity. You're going to use that description to guide what abilities you give it, what it's going to look like, you know, what it's going to act like, right? So, so you're going to use that description more than anything else. And I would argue that the most important part about an NPC is their description, right? How you role play them, uh, you know, because that's, that's where the, the NPC is going to come to life. It doesn't really matter about stats. It doesn't really matter about abilities. What matters is how you play them at the table. You know, what the players feel when they're encountering this person or this creature. So don't skimp on your description. Really make sure that your description and the name and 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 the attitude and the way that you're role-playing this character, make sure that all of that makes sense and that you're happy with that because that's going to be the most important part of any NPC that you're going to have in your game. The next thing is going to be the size of the NPC. So there is a, a size chart that we have in the book and, and it, it gives you the, the size number and next to that it gives you the number of feet that such a creature might be that would fall into, right? Kind of like a, a, like a broad range of sizes. Just based on, again, its general description, you're going to have a rough idea at least on what size category this creature should fall into. The last things is uh, what kind of gear does this this person have, or if it's a creature, what kind of natural like armaments, you know, defenses does it have? Does it have claws? Does it have fangs? Does it have a tail? Does it have scales? Does it have like thick hide? Right? You know, obviously, like if you're if you're making a bear. Uh, NPC, then that bear is going to have large claws. It's going to have like a thick hide. And, and so it, you're going to get a natural soak, you know, a natural weapon, okay, with its claws. A lot of times creatures, with, when you're talking about claws, just give it the cleave uh, uh, tag. And that's, that's sufficient for uh, demonstrating that it has like an advantage over just a person that's just got fists, okay? Um, and so that, that'll, that'll do that just fine. And that's what we do in the book for a lot of the species that have claws. We give them the cleave tag for, uh, for their natural weapon. Okay. And so that's a, a little advantage that the creatures with claws would have. Okay. So maybe the creature has some natural soak. Maybe it has some natural like defenses. Um, and, and th there might be other abilities that it has in the back of the book. We actually provide um, um, several tables for creating an animal uh, or an animal companion. Um, this is a way of, of detailing that and, and putting something on paper about it. So you can use those tables uh, to make any kind of animal that you want to put in your game. Okay, and, and there's a lot there that you can play with. When it comes to perks, only give an NPC perks if it's absolutely necessary because of the fiction, right? So if there's a dragon that uh, that's terrorizing, you know, people and you need to have a dragon monster, you know, for the player characters to fight or deal with, then sure, yeah, it's going to have the perks that a dragon has. It's going to have the ability to breathe fire. It's going to have the ability to fly, right? All of those things, you know, it's, it's you know, natural defenses, um, it's special abilities. Yeah, sure, because it's a dragon, it's going to have those things, right? But if you're having like a, an NPC that's a human, right? Uh, well, the perk for humans is they get three additional customization points during character creation. That's not relevant to an NPC. An NPC doesn't need to have customization points. NPCs in Xenoplicity don't have stats at all. Um, and so the, you're not, you're not, you're not factoring in all of those factors, right? And so because of that, you just ignore, you ignore any perks that are in the game that would not apply uh, to an NPC, okay? Don't overthink this. Uh, you only need as much detail as the NPC needs to function in the fiction. That's it. So if a perk is, has a fictional basis, right? So it's an ability that a creature would have, or if it's like um, something that, that that person can do, then sure, absolutely, right? Like a, a Sirakai alien has the ability to shapeshift. So that perk would make sense. You you would definitely have that perk go to an NPC that's a Sirakai, right? But if if the if the perk is something that only applies to like a player character, well then just ignore it and and you just move on, right? Okay, so last point to make about NPCs and the way that they're run in Xenoplicity is, the, you know, because it's a player-facing system, a lot of the times the NPCs are not making roles independently 
to attack the player characters. Uh, the, the player character is making the role in a combat situation, and if they fail that role, then they're being dealt damage by the NPC, and if they succeed, then, then they're dealing the damage. And, and depending on what you roll, then maybe both parties hit each other, right? So that can happen too. Um, but the, the problem that I have with a lot of player-facing systems is that, that that's as far as they ever take it. There's really not a lot of rules in place for what happens if an NPC wants to make an action and they're not being targeted or in, you know, interacted with by a player character. And so I think a lot of games, when they're making a player-facing system, they drop the ball on this. We didn't do that. In Xenoplicity, there is a system in place for how an NPC would act uh, or react to various things absent a player character being engaged with them because this can happen this can happen in so many different ways and it's and it's a real mistake to not include this and so we leave this to a luck roll a luck roll in xenoplicity is a d10 die six or higher is a success or a pass five or less is a failure and modifiers can apply to this luck roll based on the skill level of the npc as well as the equipment that the npc has if an npc is very well equipped maybe they get a plus one on this if they're uh, you know they, they're well experienced and they're they're competent and whatever it is they're trying to do give them another plus one for that so they might get a plus two on this roll right or, or conversely if it's someone that has no experience if they're a newbie maybe they get a minus one or even a minus two if they're really out of their element um, and then if they have poor equipment right they get a minus one from that too and so you can modify um, the the luck roll based on the circumstances that the npc finds themselves in okay um, and and so what this does is this allows for opportunities uh, for npcs to act outside of player character involvement I'll, I'll give you some examples let's say you have a wizard he summons a bear to fight for him and so he's got a summoned creature well, how do you handle, how do you resolve the bear making attacks against other people in the scene? Well, this is how you do it. You roll a d10. You just roll a d10. And, and maybe if the bear is bigger than the thing it's fighting, give it a plus one. Uh, it's got big claws, so maybe give it another plus one for that. So it gets plus two, right? And so, you know, you roll the d10, you add two to it. If it's a six or higher, then you deal damage to whatever it's attacking. If you fail that roll, then the bear gets damage during that exchange. Right, so it's either you know a, the bear is attacking and hitting or getting hit. Okay. Another example would be maybe you've got a, a someone in the party that does like psionics and does mind control on an NPC, and once uh, that you know that person they were just fighting to turn around and start shooting his own friends. Okay, cool. So again, as an NPC, you're going to leave that to a luck roll. You roll the d10. If it's a six or higher, then he actually hurts one of his friends. If he rolls a five or less, then his friends stop him or hit him back. Um, and, and so it, this is a really quick, easy mechanic to resolve that kind of situation. And this can also be applied, let's say you want an NPC to run down a hallway and start turning a lever to maybe raise a portcullis, right? Um, and maybe, maybe it will work, maybe they can do it, maybe they're not strong enough, maybe it's rusted. How do you determine whether or not what you're wanting them to do is successful or not? Again, roll a d10. A six or higher means that it works and they succeed. Uh, five or less means they fail. They fail at that thing. And so this mechanic, it's simple, it's easy, it's quick, uh, and it allows for NPCs to make roles independently from their involvement with a player character. The final point I want to make about NPCs before we go to our conversion example is that soak roles and cover roles for NPCs are always optional in Xenoplicity. This is a really important factor, guys, and I, and um, it's something that game masters, you know, directors really need to use uh, for the benefit of their table. What do I mean by this is um, you determine as the game master whether an NPC is going to get a soak after being hit by an attack or whether you're just going to skip it and just deal the damage to them. Okay, and the same goes for cover. There are lots of ways to use cover in Xenoplicity, lots of ways that you can negate incoming attacks through defensive measures, right? Whether it's pairing with swords, whether it's, uh, you know, blocking with a shield, whether it's defending with your hands up against, you know, uh, blows, uh, you know, whether or just ducking, right? If you're just trying to use cover scenery uh, to basically avoid like incoming gunfire, things like that. There's lots of ways that you can do this. And whether an NPC is going to utilize this mechanic is totally up to the Game Master and how long they want a fight to go, 
right? You can still narrate an NPC as using cover, right? If you want that picture, that narrative to exist without actually rolling the die for whether it's successful or not. You can just have that auto fail. You can say, and again, you're not rolling for it. You're just narrating that the cover doesn't work and that you hit them anyway. The same goes for soak. They might have armor. You can have an NPC that's decked out in full plate armor. And maybe the person goes up and takes a dagger and just, you know, wants to execute this guy. Well, yeah, okay, so he hits the guy, he does, he deals damage. Are you going to have a soak roll made for whether or not the damage is negated or reduced? Or are you just going to say, yeah, you kill him, you know, you know, you just plunge the dagger between his plates of armor and he falls down dead. It's totally up to the game master which of those you employ. And here's a here's another example. Maybe there's a guy, he's wearing full plate armor, but you just want to walk up to the guy and just get him to a chokehold and just choke him out. Or you just want to slug him in the face and knock him unconscious. Okay, cool. Do you allow soak rolls to negate the damage? Or do you roll, you know, resistance rolls for whether they can fight you off? Or if it's successful with, with the attack, or if it makes narrative sense and just let it happen without even a roll, you just let it happen. You don't you don't make a soak roll for these things. And, and this is the distinction. This is something we really, we do talk about this in the game book because it's important that a game master uses. If you allow soak rolls for your NPCs, the fight is going to take longer. That may be fine. Maybe that's exactly what you're looking for. You can have an extra, someone that just has one hit point, but you can use the soak roll, meaning that they can negate damage that's incoming, and you can use cover rolls, meaning they, they can stop attacks altogether before damage is dealt. You can use those things to even make an extra last a long time in a fight, right? To really make it kind of drag out a little bit if that's what you want in your fiction, if that's what you want to take place in the game world. But maybe you just want that extra to just go out really quick and really easy. Again, look to movies like Lord of the Rings. Uh, in the example of Legolas or Gimli attacking hordes of orcs, right? Every one of those orcs is wearing plate armor. They all have heavy, big plates of armor on their body, yet still, Legolas shoots one arrow, and that arrow plunges right into the guy. Whether it hits him in the face, whether it hits him in the jugular, whether it hits in his chest, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter where it hits him in the movie. That guy just falls down dead from the single arrow. This is a classic example of not rolling for soak, and if, they, if the attack hits and you deal the damage, then you as the game master, you just let the person die. You don't, you don't worry about the soak. Now, there may come a time where then later in the fight, maybe they square off against an orc and you want this fight to last a long time. You want this guy to stand out from the other orcs. And then you're going to start rolling for soak. Then you can start rolling for parries, things like that. And, and what this will do is this changes up the dynamic of the fight. It changes the pacing of a fight. And you can use these things, um, you know, and, and you can toggle them on and off as you want to for what's playing out in the game, okay? And so these are just some tools that you have at your disposal to make fights really engaging and also to, to have kind of like a dial on how long you want a fight to last. A long fight does not necessarily make a good fight. There's no reason to have an NPC get a soak roll if you just want this guy to be taken out because he's not important to what's going on in the moment. You just want to, you know, narrate a really cool death scene and then you move on, right? And so, again, you don't have to roll for soak or cover just because the mechanics are in place. Meanwhile, your player characters should be wearing as much armor as they can, right? That makes sense because they want to have a high soak value because they don't want to die. Uh, and your player characters should be utilizing cover in whatever way that makes sense uh, to try to avoid attacks and try to, to get out from getting hit. Because in Xenoplicity, getting hit really hurts. Even if it's a minor blow, you know, a bruise still can take three or five days to heal. Right, so you don't want to be carrying around that because they stack, they add up. Uh, a bruise can quickly turn into an injury, and an injury into a disability um, or outright death. Right, and so combat in Xenoblicity can be very brutal. It can be very, very lethal, and so uh, it's important that that the player characters do whatever they can to protect themselves and to to look after themselves. But this is not a factor that you need to worry about with an NPC. With an NPC, once they're defeated, they're, that's done. They're, they're, they're over, and you're not going to think about them again. You're moving on to the next thing. Uh, they don't have the same weight that a player character has. And this is 
I guess the the mentality that you want to have at your table is that the player characters are the stars of the show. Okay, if it was a movie, the player characters are the stars of the movie. If it was a TV show, the player characters are the main characters of the sitcom that have their names and faces on the front credits of a, each episode. Okay, when the theme song is playing. Okay, that's the player characters. NPCs don't have that weight. They are not that important. Um, now, there may be NPCs that, that have a lot of weight. Maybe they are really important if they're a villain or if they're like, you know, some kind of big bad guy um, that you want to play like a, you know, play up a really big role in the fiction, in the setting. That's fine. But that's not your average person in the game, right? You, your average person they're, they're on screen and off screen, and then you don't worry about them ever again. These are, these are some tools you have at your disposal to make that a reality at your table. All right, so anyway, let's go to the conversion example, and we'll wrap up the video after that. All right, guys, so we are doing a monster conversion. We're taking a creature from uh, D&D, and we're going to convert them over to Xenoplicity. Uh, just port that monster over. Uh, and again, you can do this if you uh, maybe you've got a module that's a D&D module, you want to run that module, but you want to use Xenoplicity as your system, as your game, as opposed to, you know, the, the actual D&D game. Uh, how would you do that? And so uh, I've done this as an example to kind of show you how this works. Uh, we're looking at an Onkeg here, okay? A pretty um, classic D&D monster, okay? And I found some stats for one online. And the idea behind it is, like, it doesn't take a lot at all to do this. You can do this with any monster. Uh, but I look at it on Keg uh, online. I, there's, a, there's a picture of it online, so you can get a visual representation of what this thing looks like, and that's going to come uh, into play in how we convert it. Uh, we see that in, in its stats that it is a large creature. So I, I believe in D&D that's somewhere between 8 and 16 feet in size. Um, and you know, you based on its description and its physical appearance, that again is readily available online, as well as many other monsters would be. Uh, then you can you can kind of uh, piece together how it would work in Xenoplicity, because uh, monsters are going to be fairly simple in the way that you're going to make them. So uh, here on this index card, I went ahead and jotted down the conversion of what this is going to look like. Uh, so when we look up the sizes in Xenoplicity, uh, a, a creature that's, you know, between 10 and 15 feet in size, that is going to be um, a size 5 creature. So I'm going to make this a size 5 creature. So it's going to be between 10 and 15 feet. Um, as far as hit points goes, the, the Game Master, you guys can decide for yourself how many hit points you want any creature in Xenoplicity to have. Um, obviously if it only had one hit point, then it would be an extra. It would, you know, it'd be one of many. If you wanted to like have a swarm of these things, kind of like, uh, attack the group. Um, but for a regular NPC, if you want this monster to have a little fight in it, uh, you're going to give it between three and 10 hit points. Uh, I went ahead and gave this one five hit points. Okay. Uh, we also see, just based on its description, okay, from what I see online about this creature, that it has uh, several natural abilities. Uh, number one is it's got this bite attack where it's got these big manacles, uh, and that there's it's also got like an acid bite. It's also got an acid spray that it can do so, you know, every so often. And anything it bites, it, it kind of like auto grapples. Okay, so how would I convert that over to Xenoplicity? Uh, well, for one, those big manacles to me say that it's going to have like the cleave tag. That, that's the kind of tag that you might find with a battle axe or some kind of like, uh, you know, kind of axe weapon, uh, which means that if it's not making a, a large movement for its turn that it's going to deal plus one damage just from from these manacles that you know that it's that it's got in its mouth and its maw uh, as far as the acid goes uh, we have uh, lots of different options for like you know how to like have magical augmented attacks and acid is one of them but i don't want to give this but this creature's bite attack a full power of of, of an acid attack because um, that's a little bit much. We'll use that for the acid spray that it can only do so often. Uh, but for, for this, I've kind of toned it down a bit. And so I'm just going to say that every time it bites someone successfully, it's going to deal plus one damage from the acid or, or it will make um, an item that that person had that it bit make a break roll immediately 
for something in their equipment being deteriorated by the acid. So anytime it bites um, a player character or you know a, a creature, then then if it it can either deal one plus one damage to that person right to their flesh uh, if it's an organic, or if if maybe it bites them and they're wearing armor, then the armor is going to make an immediate break roll because the acid is going to be eating away at their armor, and so it's going to deteriorate their equipment um, or it's going to be damaging them a little bit more than normal. Okay, as far as the the grapple when it bites, I just put that it auto grapples someone for one success. Uh, that's a hold strength of one, meaning that if it success successfully attacks and bites um, a character, then that character for the following turn is held in its in its jaws. Uh, it's basically like picking it up and, and biting it and it's holding it in its mouth uh, for a turn after that. And so, you know, obviously they could make a save to try to break free of that and then still act that turn. But otherwise, they're basically at its mercy the next turn as it continues to, um, you know, rip into them and uh, continue to bite and kill them. Another thing that it has is this breath weapon. Uh, obviously, this is used for creatures like dragons, but other monsters might have a breath weapon, and you can flavor it any way you want. Um, you know, dragons obviously shoot fire, but the idea is, is that it can work every D4 turns, okay? So every time you use it, you roll a D4 die, and that's how many minutes have to pass in the game before it can use that breath weapon again. Um, and I'm giving this creature, because of its description, an acid uh, spray, and this is going to deal D3 damage um, or again to items if I don't want it to damage organics immediately then it can also make an uh, it can provoke an automatic break roll and that break roll is at minus two as they're sprayed in acid so when if it does its breath weapon let's say it shoots an acid spray at your character uh, if your character may, maybe maybe uh, it hits the, your character's weapon, and so then your weapon has to make a break roll immediately, a minus two uh, from whatever whatever it normally is based on its quality. Um, and if it fails that, then the the weapon just breaks. It it, it you know it, it burns away, or you know it, it it deteriorates to the point where it's not really usable, or it's you know it's damaged at that point. Um, or you know again, it could the acid spray could just hit the person's armor, and so then while they're not taking any additional damage from that, it it would be again their armor has to make that break roll, or it starts to deteriorate and fall apart. Um, or it maybe it just hits them right in the face and they take an additional D3 damage from the acid spray. Okay. Uh, other abilities that the Ankeg has is night vision and a burrow ability. And we have, um, well, I think in D&D they call it dark vision, but in, in Xenoplicity we call it night vision. It's essentially the same thing. You can see at night. Um, and so I gave that creature night vision and I also gave it the burrow ability. In Xenoplicity the burrow ability just means that you can move um, through the ground uh, at the same rate of movement that you would move on its surface. So um, this means that this Ankeg can really uh, burrow and tunnel through the ground at the same speed that it can move above the ground. And so that really makes it a terrifying creature. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. The one other thing is the natural armor. Just looking at its description, I see that it's got that like exoskeleton kind of like insect uh, kind of uh, you know outer shell. Okay, so I went ahead and give it a natural armor of soak of two, um, and that that's going to be its natural defense. Um, you know, natural armor ranges from a soak value of one, which would be very minor, to uh, two, which is pretty average, and then you know the higher levels of three or even four. Four is going to be something akin to like dragon scale, right? So, um, you know, you just kind of use whatever feels right, whatever feels uh, feels good for you as the game master as you do the conversion. Some of this you just kind of tweak and play with, and you just kind of make it make sense for the narrative of of what this thing is. And and really, all of this I got from just looking at uh, the description, like the picture of the creature online, and then just the tiny little stat block that it that you can find online for free. So you don't need a lot to do this, and you can do this to any monster, any creature, um, you know, in any monster manual, um, you know. And so you could even have a monster manual from another game and just l use the descriptions and the pictures of those monsters to then just make them in Xenoplicity, okay? So that's, that's how you do that. So anyway, guys, uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below.